Thank you for joining me on episode six of this seven part series in Transformation We Trust. I am just falling more and more in love with this series. The more I sit with it, the more I record it, the more it unfolds in front of me in my life. The conversations, as I said last episode, I get to have just because this is coming up. I did a live last night and one of the questions that was posed was like, how do we keep our light going? How do we keep that like pilot light lit, so to speak, the pilot light that's, that keeps your furnace going, your, your internal energetic furnace going. And it's funny because on a live, the energy is so bouncy and given some time to reflect, I want to share my answer really quickly here. And my answer is only my perspective. I just feel into what perspective feels the most aligned and expanded for me. And my hope is that if I share it with you and it like gives you some decongestion, you know, when your nose is all clogged up and like one nostril decongests and you're like, it like opens up and you can breathe clear air again. You're like, oh, oh my God, thank you. Like if it can do that for your sense of like frustration around whatever it is, that's my hope. That's my aim. So how do you keep your pilot light lit? My thoughts on that right away is this is the most incredible, one of the most incredible aspects of being human is that it is lit. Like, how do you keep it lit? You don't even have to worry about it. It's lit. If you're here and you're breathing is lit. It is always lit. And when we feel as though it's gone out, it's only because we've lost sight or lost feeling of that truth, but it is always lit. That's, that's us coming here, being animated, living, like that little fire burning. It might go right down to the smallest little flame. And how do you fan that flame? How do you give it oxygen? How do you give it life? And part of it is celebrating it, knowing it's there, knowing that it's, it's lit. It's lit. Celebrate the fact that it's, it's there. You have it. It's lit. And and celebrate that and smile about that and internally feel grateful for that and that gratitude what I've found is the gratitude is like that injection that creates momentum that allows something to grow beyond what it was remember your focus is it's is food so if you're being grateful for something it's like positive fertilizer as opposed to like blocking out when you're you know fearful of something it's almost like blocking out the possibility of nutrients or the possibility of mm, sunlight oxygen right so okay this week i'm talking about purity comes from the purification process and i think in our language specifically sort of religious programming language we've looked at purity as this virginal state that um, is ascribed to us by outside people and forces as opposed to a state that we achieve through the refinement uh, process, through refining the quality of our character, through refining our values and our alignment to those values and our energetic commitment to those values and our being what we aspire to be. That's the pulling down, and I spoke about this last night on the live, pulling down that that blueprint, that etheric aspirational aspect, and really pulling it down into the body and walking it out, knowing it so well, like it happens even when you're on autopilot. And this is relates to like the subconscious programming that I talk about. Like we get into a car and we drive a car and we sometimes get to a destination and we, would, we wouldn't even give it a second thought, we've just arrived there. We want, that working for us we want our subconscious programming so aligned and attuned to what our values are and to what we want in life and to the overall experience we want to have we want that so aligned that when we do go on autopilot it's still pulling in the desired result we are looking for if it can work against us on autopilot it sure as heck can work for us on autopilot and so that's like one of my hacks that I'm looking to really share and implement and 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 talk about, right? And this this programming happens through habit. 
it happens through being in certain states. People who know me realize that I don't watch certain things before falling asleep because we're in the theta state as we fall asleep and as we wake up. We enter into that liminal space that feels very dreamy where you could almost hear someone talking to you and then that would be incorporated into your dreams a little bit. That state is so influential. That's the state where we are programming or deprogramming or working through the subconscious. So this is why I enjoy quantum healing and BQH sessions. This is why I offer it to like connect with that subconscious aspect, right? And when we can go through that subconscious aspect and look at old programming that does not work, uh, old programming that might have like defensiveness triggers or jealousy triggers or people pleasing tendencies or safety strategies that we had as children, but no longer really serve us as adults that we don't actually need. Um, when we can weed through that and pull out all the roots, pull out all the stuff, all the structure that no longer serves us and replace it with structure that does serve us, that is intentional. This is, you know, the, the aspect of conscious evolution, intentional evolution. When we can replace that with what is intentional for us. We then set that stage, that foundation for attracting to us what we are actually looking for even on autopilot and if you really start to look and pay attention we're on autopilot a lot it could be that we are on autopilot while having a conversation with someone we could go into autopilot every time we're driving and i say autopilot i want to be more respectful of it it's it's a very interesting nuanced state and this autopilot helps us sometimes when we're in a panic it helps us you know it helps our our body still achieve or walk out what we're meant to be doing all the while our mind might be addressing something else so I want to pay reverence to this aspect, but it's been explained to me before by Dr. Bruce Lipton and a few other people that I've studied in terms of hypnosis and this subconscious brain state as like a recorder. It's not consciously discerning. It just literally takes in the information, which is why I've said in previous episodes up to the age of seven, we're just taking in programming. We're not discerning the programming, saying take toss. We don't have enough life experience to say, oh, this person's, you know, angry with me and calling me this name and it's because they're having a bad day or they don't know how to deal with their emotions. We're just taking it in as truth because we're in this absorption phase. We're in the sponge like phase. So this is why I do not watch anything anxiety provoking before bed. Um, why, if anything, I listen to like sleep hypnosis or affirmational uh, hypnosis as I've recorded myself to remind myself. And again, this isn't for everybody, but for me, I'm finding it to be a wonderful practice that has absolutely enhanced the programming that I am trying to intentionally create or the structure. I don't even want to say programming because it is has somewhat of a negative connotation, but the structure and foundation that I'm willing to set in my subconscious to create the um, underlying consistent way of being that I am trying to intentionally create. So this is like the release, renew and realize, right? Release what programming no longer works for you. Renew and reset your foundation of what you're looking to experience and realize, self-actualize through this process. And it takes time. And this doesn't have to be through subconscious programming. This can be a, forming a new habit. And you know that it's, it's tricky to, to form a new habit. And you'll have old situations, scenarios come up that will, you know, you could continue doing that loop, that circle, that well-worn bike path. But it's Every time we interrupt that loop, every time we divert from that loop, we're breaking that connection. Every time we reach for something higher that we really want, something more conscious that we really want, we break that connection. Now, you know, some people argue we're only conscious for like five to 10% of the time, which, you know, there's a whole other theory of study where you can expand your presence. You can expand your present awareness. And I would say that for me feels like endurance training. And I've been working on that and I can find that now I can hold presence through more things. I also really noticed in that practice how many times I would leave the body, so to speak, or take myself out of the scenario based on an emotional reaction that I didn't want to have. 
this could be based on something that is triggering for me or something that I feel overwhelmed with dealing with, or sometimes it's just something I don't like and I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to become, um, you know, crass or harsh and, and like be rude about it. So I kind of like go into another place and I'm only half listening and I'm working through becoming more honest. And I definitely find that when I'm in my highest, most ex expanded state, I can, you know, take on a conversation and, and sort of bring my highest self to meet that person's highest self and listen through the conversation. But I definitely in the past had triggers where I would just kind of go into another place and not really fully be there and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and passively listen but mostly be thinking about something else or being somewhere else. Or if it was an emotional situation where, you know, there was a fight or there was something happening that, you know, was uncomfortable, I would find, I would sort of numb out to the situation. So I'm working through my own process of becoming present more and more and more, and also understanding my ability to hold the capacity for overarching love and acceptance and compassion in those moments where it really is an opportunity for someone else to speak their the things they need to speak and I can be compassionate I can hold space and then I can also be mindful of my time and energy and how much I'm willing to allocate to it it's very much a game of give and take it's very much a game of of understanding what it looks like to share in communion with one another and also be very intentional about where you place your focus and time so in this process, I feel like it's really a process of bridging the past to the future through the vehicle of the present, of the now moment, of being present. And that's where we can make conscious choices and conscious decisions, right? Our past is like, you know, it, as I said last week or last episode, exists in the body. Our past really does um, imprint through our body and we can find that sometimes when we get into similar situations that could be triggering we have well-worn ways of doing something and we almost go into it and as i said interrupting that process is key is key to creating breakthrough is key to creating shifts is key to creating change and deep transformation and so along with deep transformation and creating these subtle shifts in our patterning it's also looking at the roots of things and really planning for what do I actually want to replace this when there is a space created because I'm looking to weed my garden so to speak uproot the things that no longer resonate uproot the things that no longer feel good uproot the things that are keeping me stagnant stuck or confined once I uproot those things I have space in my garden and instead of that space being taken up by more distractive things or more things that sort of file in what do I want to fill it with what am I looking to intentionally create and I want to jump back for a second. When I talk about stopping a habit, like interrupting, even if we interrupt mid sentence, like I've caught myself a few years back, I was really working on acceptance of my body, loving my body for what it is, loving my body for the way I, it, it was given to me. And this is a journey that I think many women and men and bodies, human bodies, human people, human beings are going through and have gone through. And I got really vigilant about how I would speak about my body, the conversations I would allow to be had around me and my body, whose business was it to talk about my body, comment on my body, and how I looked at my body. And it was really, I'd be mid-sentence and I'd interrupt and I'd say, hang on, no. I like, and I would, and I would just go, sorry. And I, I would find a way to fumble through the conversation, but it was really important to me because my body is listening. The programming that I'm doing in those moments, words mean something to a degree. And that's a, a conversation for a whole other episode is the multi-dimensional aspect of our language and how on one level it can mean one thing and on another level it can mean something else and how it can be somewhat benign on one level and somewhat profound on another level. But conversation for another day. Uh, I was really vigilant about looking at my language and how I spoke about myself and I would interrupt the processes regardless of how that looked to the other people I was talking to and and do you know what the benefit was that sometimes they could see what I was doing and it was almost an idea that they could say hey I could work with that too and when you think about it it makes sense like I have a puppy right now and we are training her for certain things and currently we are training her not to jump on the bed throughout the night and sleep in our bed because we did allow her to be in the bed for quite some time and she is now 70 pounds and as long as we are and we want her not to be in the bed 
So I'm trying to teach her this and I have to interrupt the process. Every time she goes to jump up in the bed, I have to interrupt the process. I see it in this basic, basic way. Every time she gets through the full process of coming up on the bed and we leave her, that's a success. And that adds to the bucket of this is the correct behavior. Every time she gets up on the bed and I interrupt it and send her back to her bed, that's a success in my eyes. And that's the behavior I'm looking to enforce and reinforce and the habit I'm looking to create. So I interrupt it. And I have been really mindful, like when my husband might let her sometimes and like, well, it's one time and I'm saying, but we're creating a habit here and we're not interrupting that process. So that process gets reinforced as opposed to the other one. So each opportunity is really just a drop in the bucket of one habit being formed or another habit being formed. Now with us as humans, we have this horrible habit of really self-deprecating when we do the wrong thing, when we don't get it perfect, when we don't do the thing we intended to do. So I want to be really clear. This is not an opportunity for self-shaming or self-maiming or turning our growth and healing against ourselves. This is not to weaponize new strategy against yourself. This is literally to notice and just remember If you're aware of these results, don't shut down and, oh my God, I've done it 10 times this week when I wanted to do it less. Like that kind of thought has a shut down and not be available to the information about our alignment. Don't be confused about why you haven't created a habit if you're going against the habit you're creating, but also don't come down on yourself because that really doesn't help you shift anyway. So this is this idea of bridging, reparenting, mirror work like I say mirror work because I find that to be so incredible when I was talking about the body work um, integrating mirror work like for a long time I could look in the mirror at a surface level but to stand and stare in the mirror was very uncomfortable for me and it's funny because I know people who can and who talk to themselves in the mirror and I was like oh cringe and I really had I really knew in that moment that I felt cringe like am I in a space to tackle this. If I'm feeling something is cringy, but yet intuitively I get a hit like, why? And should I be cringing looking at myself in the mirror that close? Like, interesting. There's some information for me here. I don't need to shy away from it, but interesting. And so I really started to practice mirror work and I followed people that did mirror work and I watched how they, you know, spoke about it, how they attributed their uh, connection with self. We can do this with your phone, with video. And I just find it to be a wonderful tool. So this is like this process ends up being where we connect to our future and higher self. We we bridge the past and the future together with the present now moment. So we bridge the material existence of what we're already experiencing, right? So what we're experiencing now is based on past understandings of what we wanted what we created, what we've already created. What we're experiencing currently is based on what we've already created. What we will experience in the future is based on our aspirations and what we want to create. And we're bridging that, right? We're bringing the etheric understanding, the aspirational understanding. We're bringing that down into the vessel. We're integrating it. We're living in integrity because we've integrated our values and we're bridging that moment so that we more fully walk into that version of ourselves that we are aspiring. So first though, before we we fully like hit and walk into that version of ourselves, we have to be deeply present and accepting with who we are now. We actually have to come into enjoyment of who we are now. And that sometimes can be frustrating when you're not where you want to be. But this is a crucial point because it's really hard to get to where you want to go while you're completely dissatisfied with where you are. It doesn't create the energetic container and context for flourishing. It's like continuing to like pour poison onto your garden and wonder why you can't get those seeds you planted to grow. And so being deeply present and enjoying who you are, this is like working with 
both shadow and light, right? Both past and aspirational. We, we see the light aspects of us. We see the aspiration. We see the shadow areas where we weren't fully conscious or we weren't fully um, choosing the behaviors or maybe we were choosing destructive behaviors that weren't really getting us where we wanted. We were distracted by behaviors that really weren't aligning us to our values and what we want. Um, and I would say, if you're still not even sure about what you want, pop back into that clarity or pop back into a investigative experience where you can really sit with what do I actually want? What are my values? What am I actually aligning to? I talk about alignment a lot, but if we don't even know what we're aligning to, how can we be measuring it in any given moment to know if we're on in alignment or not? So really sitting with, you might find like, oh shoot, I've been aligning to all these other things that I don't really care about, that I don't really want. That's not really for me. I've been just sort of keeping up with the Joneses with these alignments, they're not mine. Or I've been you know, keeping up this facade of something that really doesn't sit right with me and I don't want it. Shoot, I had no idea. All my energy was funneling into these alignments that weren't really what I wanted. And when you're misaligned at a soul level, like the reason we feel discord is because there's that aspect of us that knows that alignment. And that's what discord is there for, to show us like you're not in alignment with your deepest calling, your deepest soul wants, your deepest soul desires. You're not in alignment with what would make you feel thriving, alive, and free. Because I do believe we are meant to feel that completely. And if we don't feel that, there is a misalignment somewhere. And because things are so nuanced and layered and programming is so thick and past you know experiences layer on so much it's really hard to see well where am I misaligned like where did this fall off the rails where did I get misaligned and what behaviors am I doing right now that don't seem to sit with that which is why it's so key to really outline your values maybe just five of them in the beginning maybe three but like what do you actually value and they might be really big in the beginning like I value freedom I value um my family. I value my relationships. And then we get more nuanced. So like, how do I value those? How do I want to feel my family relationships to be? Like my relationship with my children, I want to be incredible. I want to look back and say, man, we had an incredible time. My children want to be with me. They want to spend time with me. I want to spend time with them. I really raised some great humans. They have their autonomy. They have their independence. They have, you know, they are able to surmount any experience life throws at them and they really 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 are compassionate people like how do I want my experience to be with my family what are the values I have for raising children and then am I living that every day so thinking about those values and getting into alignment really really help and then with this you like raise yourself into you raise yourself up and into higher levels of who you are and that's that's really the work right that's really what we're doing here it's ongoing process of raising ourselves up and out of patterns and programs that do not align us with what we actually fully desire in life. And so it's integrating like your child, your teen, your jaded adult into like the version of yourself that can hold all those parts and really use the best aspects of all and really love the shadow aspects of each and every one of those. So you can and you will do this. Once you start working towards this, the fact that you're even listening to this and interested in transformation, you're doing it, you're aware of it, you're conscious of it, and you will do it. You will do it. The when and where doesn't need to be a, a confinement that you put on yourself, but the fact is you're here and it will naturally start to gain momentum and compound as you go. And that's what I think the beauty of transformation is. It, it gathers its own momentum at a certain point. And nobody does it better for you than you. Like, so this is why turning internally is so important. Leaning on this internal guidance system is so important because your unique makeup, your unique history, your unique experiences are what eventually lead you to your unique gifts. Like everything you hit on this path, you hit it for a reason so that you can expand into something, into a gift, into a talent, into... Uh, an area that somebody else can look to for support or look to on their journey for aspiration or inspiration or to solve a challenge or a problem because no doubt we're always going to be faced with those like we don't I don't think we get somewhere where there's like literally no problems or challenges anymore 
but I believe that we are uniquely set up to bring our abilities to the fore and really create an incredible experience. So nobody does it better for you than you. So make sure you tune in to that internal guidance. And it's okay that you won't always feel firm in the things that you choose, but know that your your top, your highest is empowering you. And at some point you'll stop needing or desperately needing certain things. You'll notice that you're able to operate without this feverish need or this um, anxious worry around how things are going to unfold. You'll start to like lean into the fact that you'll be able to handle whatever comes. You're co-creating with the universe. Your inner child has got the curiosity, lightness and play covered. Your inner teen has the courage, the like brash, bold, sexy part of things. I mean, sexy is in like being yourself, being out there. Like when I was like 19, 20, I felt like, poof, I felt myself then. And it's funny because it gets tempered, I think, with age and experience. But I, it's, it's funny, there are seasons in my life where I lost touch with that a little bit. And I forgot what it felt like to feel like hot, like just like coming of age, having your hormones racing, feeling you know, in that version of yourself that was so alive. And so um, I just think each part of these aspects of you have it covered. And when we can integrate and unify them, we really get to feel the power of them working together. And that's, that's the flame. That's the fuel. That's the catalyst. That's the catapulting. That's, that makes the difference. And so when you start to walk this path and you start to feel these things out, it doesn't mean that you won't like be realistic. And it doesn't mean that at times you won't choose the lower choice. Like when you're in a habit, it doesn't mean that you won't choose the old habit. You may choose the old habit and that's fully okay. As I said earlier, remember, it does not help to get angry with yourself and you will start to discern the difference you won't be in the dark as to why, right? You won't be, as I said earlier, it won't feel like, I don't know why I can't create this new habit if I don't make the choice that I might, I've might i been, like I set out to make. The choice that I knew was the new choice, the new alignment. You won't be in the dark about it. You won't be confused about why you're not getting the result you want and why you're getting a different result that you don't want. You're aware of it and that's okay. And, that's, and there's no... Uh, judgment and making yourself wrong over it. It's just simply comes down to neutral cause and effect. Like, oh, well, that's why I'm getting that because I'm not doing that thing. It's like the working out, the working out paradox. Like, how do I work? How do I work out and get the benefits of working out without working out? Like, is there some way around it? You know, if I want the experience of exercising my endurance, if I don't exercise my endurance, I won't get an expanded exercised endurance. It's, it's simple when we think about it, but we put a lot of other little things in the play in place to to sort of distance ourselves from the reality of the the reality of the habit we are not forming. And then we shame ourselves and then we don't want to look at it. And then we, you know, it the, the becomes this whole other game of like dodging a reality when really we could accept the reality, not get down on ourselves from it and know that when you're ready and willing to do it, you will. And so in this aspect, we start to choose from a different place. We start to become a bit more gentle with ourselves. Uh, we start to reparent in a gentler way. We start to coax ourselves along development, along the lines of development with our own adult as it forms in a compassionate way. So we are forming and reforming the inner parent at the same time as the inner parent is reparenting the child and the teenager and incorporating them all and loving them all and doing the shadow work and feeling with this process feeling into this process and holding still with it sitting with it and releasing our knee-jerk reaction to project or to hop 
in, in into and out of old loops, right? We we start to release the um, hotness of the moment. We start to take on the observer perspective a little bit more, and from that observer perspective, we have a little more time and a little more space, and we're not necessarily reacting. We're getting to choose where we focus our attention. We're witnessing it all. We're not sublimating or or stuffing down anything. We're seeing it and now we're witnessing, choosing the new. We're choosing our alignment in every new moment. And so we're allowed all of this. Again, really want to reinforce coming down on yourself and, and getting upset about uh, making a choice that is not within your new alignment or within your identified alignment does not help your situation and you're allowed all of the experience and when you are ready and you have the energy you will you will release you will renew you will see the other side you'll see the other person's perspective you will hold a greater capacity capacity for compassion you will be able to connect with your heart and your body you will be able to see the past and the future and you'll see the convergence of how they play into the now moment and how you can choose you integrate and heal the past that is sitting within the body the past pains the past hurts the past memory i like to look at the body at all the cells in the body as as cellular uh, memory holders and so we hold like where else are we storing memory when we think about it like if energy takes up space and energy is a thing, and energy of emotions come into the body, and maybe we stop the energy from fully passing through because something is traumatic and we freeze. Where are we freezing that energy within our body? We're freezing in a cell somewhere. And as we release it, we release the programming in the body, and and our nervous system can sometimes get taxed because it's holding so much of the past. It's holding so much of the programming that we've experienced and we have to make room. We have to release some of that programming. We have to create space so that we can be in the now moment so that our energy reserves aren't holding all these tabs open all the time so that we can bring ourselves into the present moment and we're not assessing every situation with hundreds of filters of the past, hundreds of lenses of the past, right? So the energy coming through doesn't have to travel through hundreds of if you imagine it like films, like little films in the cells, little frozen films, little frozen pictures of an instance where we were traumatized, hurt. We decided we would never do something again. We held on to emotion because it was too hard to process. We bring our body up to a metabolism rate that we burn off all the extra. We transmute the extra that is no longer necessary. We burn it out of our system. We create space, we transmute it, we alchemize it, if you will. We take all of these threads that we are carrying and alchemize them into something that is allows us to look at the emotion and release it. And it brings us more and more into the present moment. So that when we're asked a question like, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? We don't have to take years and years of like oh but if i do that i'll feel this way and if i do that it means this and if i do this it means that and that really feels like this old experience when i did that like the weight of having all that come into our decision making in every now moment is an incredible expenditure of energy so if we're looking to become more decisive more intuitive on this path like if if we could just listen to our intuition and say yep no yep no and go through that process like decisions literally become yes or no yes or no yes or no it's very efficient for our energy but if we haven't really looked at why we're saying yep or no or if there's programming between the things we say yes or no to we haven't necessarily done the clearing it is a great practice but sometimes we really do need to look at well what what am I carrying here what historical evidence am I carrying into the present moment and am I really living in present time if I'm carrying all this historical evidence in my body, in my vessel, in my conscious awareness. Um, So this is where I think we can be really intentional about our healing, where we can really be intentional about um, reparenting. We can create the adult, the adult parent within us that will always be. I heard another thing recently that was really cool, which was like the subconscious or the inner 
child does not necessarily know where the reparenting is coming from. It doesn't really occur to it to be discerning about that. It just needs a certain level of reparenting and a certain kind, um, you know, kind presence to steer or to have it feel safe. And so it doesn't matter if you get that from some other authority or person or if you do it for yourself. And in fact, doing it for yourself is probably the most efficient and wise way to do it. So when you create your own inner parent through your own wisdom and your own intention and your own love, your own self-love, your own self-appreciation, you're effectively creating something in your body that can always handle any moment that is that archetype for stability that is the archetype for um wisdom that is the archetype that holds space for the energy of curiosity fun and light to do the things it needs to do in life while having the stability the uh wisdom and the structure that also we need to navigate through our experience so in this process it becomes really important to look at what fills your cup and what drains you. And this is why the language of energy is so important to me because I wasn't aware of what was filling my cup or what was draining me until I tuned into the energy of how I felt, the energy of what that did in terms of draining or filling. Um, And nothing can take your power. Let me just be clear about that. And power and energy are similar but different. Like your overall power of who you are, your sovereignty, your right to be here, your right to make decisions, your right to sit in your free will, all of that is your power. You are powerful. Nobody can take that away from you. It is unalienable. You just are. It would be silly to think that. That's like, you know, somebody being able to take your life force energy out of you and use it. Like murder, killing happens, yes. But nothing can take your life force energy and take it from you. Your energy is a little bit different. You can sort of allow your energy to feel like it's drained on different things, on defensiveness, on certain boundaries, on certain activities, right? You can willingly spend your energy, let's say. So coming to terms with what fills your cup and what drains you is incredibly important. Logically, I would think what fills my cup are certain actions. And I was shown that Sometimes I can intellectualize and think something is good for me and is filling my cup, only later to find out, no, that's actually a drain. Oh, that was a people-pleasing behavior. I was getting praise, but praise doesn't necessarily fill my cup internally. What fills my cup internally is the things that I do to fill my cup, the things I consciously choose that feel good for me, that I can do for myself. And if I'm looking for other people to fill my cup, it's not a sustainable energy source and it's not necessarily uh, as rich of an energy source as when I have this knowingness on tap, I've tapped my inner well and I can pour from it any time, right? And when we say, well, when you have enough, you can pour into others. This makes a difference when you pour into others and you get to... I guess overflow together when that other person is also enjoying and then you get to create and splash around and look at this metaphor it's going wild but I really believe that when you have an overflow and you're like sharing with others it's not necessarily that you're unsustainably filling their cup with your energy once you understand how to create your own energy on tap and so know your tools know your strategies Um, know the things that help fill your cup and get really clear and mindful on what drains you what feels like you know after spending a few hours talking with someone about something do you leave feeling exhausted do you leave feeling a little drained do you leave feeling like oh that was a bit of like a drain on my energy I really don't have a ton left to do what I wanted to do Does it shift your energy? Now suddenly you woke up bubbly and bright and now suddenly you're feeling um, less than, less than that. And, And so get really clear on what your energy is. And at some point, you either A, don't put yourself in situations where your energy gets drained like that, or B, you know how to so beautifully navigate, and this is obviously the choice that I'm striving towards, so beautifully navigate these interactions so that it doesn't drain any of your energy and you can still be compassionate and be there with people and not have to avoid. Like Obviously, the sustainable solution is to be able to be in your energy and have your energy on tap and be so solid in your field that it doesn't get drained, that it that uh, there isn't taps on your energy that are slowly leaking it, or you have cracks and holes where it's spilling out. And so 
understanding that is so helpful in terms of like self-healing, self-repairing, self-activating, self-initiating, self-actualizing. From that path, you start to create the new and then you just reinvent for, you know, better and better iterations. You just adapt to the environment and you create and life begins to feel more like a dance. When you get a certain amount of healing under your belt or a certain amount of um, reclaiming the structure in which you're going to live your life by, you start to really dance with life in a different way. And I really want to say that the healing aspect of the journey is not like It's something you visit when you find something has happened, but it's not somewhere you stay forever. Like there is a moment where you recognize, okay, like I'm starting to get bed sores. (laughs) Sitting in this bed is, you know, recouping is, it's gone beyond that point. I've actually become comfortable here. We can get comfortable in many states. We can get comfortable in depression. We can get comfortable in hermiting. We can get comfortable in healing. We can get comfortable in being you know, in a victim mentality, we can get comfortable. I was listening to someone speak about the positive implications for some of the negative things happening within their life. And this person had their husband helping and doing things for them, doting on them. And they realized like, oh, perhaps part of the reason why, you know, I'm not fully jumping out into my next season or fully jumping out into my next experience where I put myself out there again is because when I was in this place I was being doted on a little bit I really enjoyed being cared for and again no shame in that like when we look for change we really have to look for okay well what are the positive implications of staying in the place that I'm at and there's no shame in it but it just means there are is positive momentum going the other way with the alignment so if I want to align to this new version of me that goes out and does this thing Where is there any drag or where is there any positive alignment for me staying in the place that I am and weigh that out. It's your choice ultimately, but weigh out like, oh, okay, well, do I really want, you know, to be looked after completely to the point where I'm not really putting myself out there? Is it worth it for me to miss out on opportunities that my my heart and my desire are really pushing me towards because this is comfortable, this is peaceful, and I'm being looked after. And so all of that self-knowledge is really good information again not shown to you so you can cut yourself up about it but just shown to you so you can make clear and informed decisions this is what discernment is about it's not about judgment like i'm a bad person because i love being waited on because my you know my foot my ankle sprained and like i'm sort of milking it longer because i enjoy it when we (laughs) come to that knowledge it's not so we can say what a horrible person i am it's so we can say okay And there's a choice point here. And how lucky am I to recognize this choice point? This is incredible. I have a choice. I get to choose. Wonderful. And so this is this like self-initiating state, self-activating, right? I've repaired and now I'm going to activate myself. I'm going to stimulate myself into a new experience. I'm going to stimulate and activate myself into a new version of myself. I'm going to self-initiate. So I'm going to start the process. I'm going to tell myself and celebrate Every time I I hit a milestone or I do something different or I choose the new path, like, holy smokes, look, you're doing it. You're choosing the new thing. You're doing the new thing. And celebrating that self-initiation and recognizing rites of passage is so incredible because at this small level, the gains matter and maybe people don't notice it yet. And we're also leaving behind attachment to external validation. Developing your own internal validation is important. It's part of developing your own internal parent. It's that internal parent that can say, well done, good job. That's the role. So developing that aspect of you is, is instrumental in creating momentum, sustaining momentum, and moving forward. And the celebration can be anything from just like, wow, look at that, to I'm going to have a treat, to whatever it is that makes you feel as though I've marked this moment I've got a foothold in this moment, so there's no backsliding. Like I see that I've made the progress. I'm I'm really taking this in. This is who I am now. I'm I've climbed this to this level. I'm at this peak or this plateau at this moment. And I recognize how far I've come. And I don't tell myself that I'm not accomplishing it. I don't get to hold the story anymore that I'm you know, beginner or that I'm not doing it or that I don't know how. I actually have concrete 
um, experience that I am doing it. I've rewritten the narrative. So this is like committing to yourself, holding your own hand and connecting to your inner child who holds the key to your essence, your hope, your pure potential, your limitlessness, your vision, your gusto. Like think about the imagination you had as a kid. We need those aspects of ourselves to reach levels that we didn't we didn't ever reach before that we didn't know were possible this vision this imagination that is childlike that you know people kind of see as like something that needs to be left in the past as we grow up absolutely not if you're trying to create something completely new for yourself you need the vision you need the curiosity you need the ability to dream and imagine and pull that etheric blueprint of your next version into the present your inner child helps you do that. It's the only one open enough, loose enough, limber enough to recognize it, sense it, and bring it through. So if your inner child is terrified of change because it doesn't feel stable, that's an indication of like reparenting. We need to bring in that structure that has that child feeling safe enough to vision the new. And if your inner parent is too busy saying like those are silly things imagination is silly using your vision is silly that's airy fairy that's that's too woo woo that's not something that's going to bring me the change i want it's grinding it's pushing it's forcing i would say that there's a, a bit of an imbalance there's that's not how i'm experiencing shifting because i've come to understand that i need the vision to be able to bring in what i have never seen before otherwise i get what i've always got because i'm doing what i've always done and so you connect this child, inner child version, you bridge this inner child version, the key to your power, the key that is your essence. Like your inner child came in with your essence so strong. Who you were as a child wasn't all you were going to be, the whole acorn oak tree thing, but it came in with your potency so strong. Go back and look at some childhood pictures and really embrace the fact that that version of you held on to your essence for you and has been holding on to it for when you are ready to come and connect with it again. They have your essence, they have your hope, they have your faith, they have your pure potential, your limitlessness, your vision, the version that thinks it can accomplish or do anything in life. They hold the key to that. And when you get to connect that with your wise, conscious, powerful adult that says good job, that knows how to walk out in life, that knows how to create, that knows how to get you a place to live, and you know that you're able to carry this out because you're a a free being in your sovereignty and you make wonderful choices and when you don't you're ready to learn and you're compassionate and you know this to the core then you're actualizing this journey on a whole new level and it's really incredible so thank you for joining me this week again Next week will be the last or next episode will be the last episode in the series. It is episode number seven. And this is uh, your world is your oyster. This is the um, brilliance and the beauty of when you get to this, this place. And as always, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the ride. Be well.